today, Elizabeth Suhai from Washington University, where she is an associate professor. And we organized this show for you because you rarely get to see it in DC, right? right? Uh, although you do know some now as well. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I just want to briefly introduce uh, our speaker here, uh, Dr. Suhai, got her PhD at the University of Michigan. And uh, we, of course, uh, know her work because she has done quite a bit of work in political psychology. And I really like how you phrase your overarching questions uh, to some of your projects, which is I want to explain inequalities and whether they are caused by biology, so uh, uh, nature, uh, by the environment, uh, nurture, or choice, free will. Uh, and that's kind of a really nice way to describe uh, all your different projects uh, that you're working on. And I just want to remind ourselves, uh, I know uh, some of us have even talked about her work and, and other contexts about uh, her work on the role of anger, uh, on motivated reasoning, uh, published in the psychology, her work on polarization uh, in political communication, and uh, I think uh, a lot of us are also familiar with her work uh, that is about the reaction to the rise of the biology debates in political science, how a bio biological explanations uh, seem to rise and uh, what it uh, causes, what kind of consequences this uh, new discourse and this new development of research has. And uh, she has been working together with one of our student members, or uh, former student members, Alexandre, who was a student of the CSDC. Uh, and uh, I have read also with great interest her critique on twin studies more generally. Uh, and uh, a lot of work that she has done on scientific knowledge uh, and people's perceptions of scientific knowledge. And I think that also relates a little bit to your newer project, which you won't present today, which is about scientific communication. Uh, uh, science uh, communication, how to make it more effective and how we can be in better dialogue with uh, policymakers. And I think that relates a lot to what we try to do as a center when we think about knowledge mobilization um, as well. So uh, a lot of uh, overlapping interests here. I also should mention your work on authoritarianism and immigration attitudes. Um, and today I think you're going to, uh, she, she's going to talk about a new book project uh, about how Americans on the left and right explain uh, socio-economic uh, equality. And uh, I should also mention that uh, Elizabeth's work has uh, received lots of uh, interesting grants, uh, NAS and NSF grants. Uh, she has participated in the tests uh, competition received grants there and just recently received the best paper award uh, from OXA. So let's welcome Elizabeth uh, for her talk. Thank you. That was a very nice, very thorough mesh for everything. <laughs> I forgot to mention your photo of books that uh, you get when you look at your website. This is the first uh, identity that you present, so yeah, I wanted to mention that. Let's that way. <laughs> um, so I, I want to ask first um, if I should speak this way or is this actually this on? Is this working? Is the microphone not working? Okay. Can you hear me okay? If I just okay, great. Um, so yes, so as you said, this is um, a book project that I am working on. Um, I received some funding from the Russell Sage Foundation uh, to do original data collection. And um, I will be talking you through um, findings from those data sets today. Uh, even though technically I have been working on this since 2016, um, it's been kind of a slow process. I have other projects going, and so I, I still feel very much like I'm at the beginning of this. Um, and so uh, hopefully you'll, you'll bear with me. This is an in-process in project. Um, but. It's a really wonderful opportunity for me to get feedback from you. This is actually a case where I'm happy to run additional tests. Um, I expect you to, and um, I, I likely will conduct um, one additional experiment. So if you want to tell me to collect additional data, um, I won't be mad. All right. So um, you know the subject of my um, project is uh, how people and focusing on Americans, kind of limiting my, my purview, but hopefully it's relevant elsewhere, how they explain inequality. And one of the reasons why I focus on this in the US context, of course, is because there's been an explosion of economic <laughs> inequality in the US over the last couple of decades. 
Um, what I have, I have one figure to show you about economic inequality in the U.S. And what I've chosen to focus on here is not that over time change, but actually um, looking at inequality. This is tracking uh, disposable income over different percentiles in the population. And what this does, which a lot of charts don't do that you see that focus on economic inequality, is it actually breaks it down by race and ethnicity and also by gender. And so you can see, of course, we know the story very well that the United States is a, a highly unequal society um, for a developed nation. And here you can also see that there are um, pretty stark differences when you compare people. Um, so we have white males at the top, so the, the blue line, <clears throat> and we have uh, green and purple, black Americans, males and females, and then the Latino community. And so if you look actually across these percentiles, you'll find that um, per capita disposable income, white males are often, they have twice as much as people at, at the bottom to be Latinas. Okay, so my talk today is not about why this inequality exists or what to do about it. Other people are working on that, which I'll show you. Um, but to think about how ordinary people explain this and how that relates to political views. Okay, so I'm, I'm joining this literature. There's been, thankfully, actually a boom in um, political science among people who study American politics in um, studying economic inequality from a policy perspective, from an opinion perspective. And so, um, Larry Bartels, this is actually the second edition of his book, but he kicked this off, I believe, in 2008, his first version of Unequal Democracy, looking at how people think about um, inequality, some confusion they have about inequality and what to do about it, um, and also problems of responsiveness among our policymakers, right? And Marty Gillens has focused on that as well. Nick Carnes has talked about um, basically how wealthy our members of Congress are. Uh, you've got various other folks thinking about uh, socialization, people who go off to college, which is in the United States. Um, uh, uh, universities um, often are um, you know, heavily tilted toward people who come from fairly affluent families and how there's a basically conservative, economic conservative socialization that happens there. Okay, so in various other works, um, if you haven't looked at this yet, Spencer Piston's new book about uh, class attitudes, uh, my friend Christina Trump, who has um, some articles about actually how too easily people um, kind of excuse away inequality, um, thinking that they want to view the world as just, right? Um, so anyway, so there's this fairly big literature that I'm joining, um, but I think that the literature is overlooking a couple of different things. So the first thing that um, is, I think, obvious to me and actually has been obvious to others and has, has been a source of criticism for people who study economic inequality uh, and politics is that oftentimes it's fairly simplistically looked at and um, there's no attention to the disparities we see among racial groups and among um, genders. Uh, so that first chart is something that you wouldn't often see in a talk about economic inequality. This is actually something that um, the class and inequality section of ABSA is trying to address and um, interesting timing but just yesterday I was asked to be on a diversity and inclusion committee <laughs> and so we are trying to bring people more in and encourage research that actually looks at these intersections. Okay, okay so that's the first thing that's missing. The second thing, um, obviously if, if you know my work and the title of my talk, is that there's not a lot of uh, focus on people's factual beliefs about what is causing all of this inequality. And you know, for a political scientist, you might think that this would be related to people's political views. Right? So, this is where I'm going to be looking. Okay, so I'm asking, what do Americans think causes inequality? And um, this is something, it, it has been fairly ignored by political scientists, with some exceptions in recent decades, but you do see a fair amount of attention from psychologists, from sociologists, and actually increasingly eco economists are, are also looking at this. So I'm doing a lot of interdisciplinary work and pulling from this other these other fields, um, but um, you know, not to be too parochial about this, but people who are working in other fields often don't, I think, appreciate the complexity of, of politics and political attitudes as a political scientist would. So I'm hoping that I contribute um, 
uh, with you know greater um, knowledge and just attention to the political. So the reason why it is important to study how people explain inequality, um, I would argue that this is a part of people's ideologies. So if you think about classic definitions of ideologies, not just about people's preferences, people's attitudes, people's affects, it's also about the factual premises that are thought to support those views. I mean, we'll talk about whether or not they actually support them or how that relationship works, but uh, certainly, uh, so going back to, to Congress's article, um, he talks about policy views, political views, but also constraint between those views, not only amongst themselves, but also with um, essentially factual beliefs that bolster those views. And if we, and today we may talk about, especially in the question and answer, I'm happy to talk about, you know, how much ideology there actually is in the public, how organized it is, etc. Um, and certainly it's been a lot of criticisms um, of work that tries to make a strong argument that people are very ideological in thinking. But when it comes to explaining inequality, we look at the work by psychologists and sociologists, some of different scientists, it does appear to be, it does appear to be some ideological thinking um, in this classic sense. And so one of the ways that, that we can see that is a very simple divide, which is well known, which is that political conservatives, and here we're focusing more on economic conservatives, are more likely to blame individuals who are suffering from poverty, for example, poor economic outcomes, other negative outcomes in their lives. And they're also more likely, by the way, the flip side is true, they give credit to people who do well, right? So those people at the top of that income distribution, you know, bravo, they work very hard, they likely are very skilled, opposite for people at the other end. Um, and then liberals, people on the left, have to be careful of how I use these labels as I travel outside the US, uh, people on the left are more likely to blame society, structural factors, um, find ways to excuse the individual from the problems they're facing. And logically, these things line up with policy preferences of economic conservatives and economic liberals, right? So if you're blaming the individual, morally, there's not much government should do about it. Maybe practically, there's nothing government can do about it if they can't even help themselves, right? And if you're blaming society, well, then we should do something about it, right? And we can do something about it. So you can see how, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a nice tight logic to this. And frankly, this is where a lot of my work has been, talking, thinking about this logic. But to see throughout this talk today, it all kind of begins to fall apart. I actually think that um, it is quasi-logical. It appears logical. But I'm not sure that people are actually themselves working through that logical process. OK, so but a little bit more on that divide. Um, you can find lots of quotes from famous American politicians saying things you know, that indicate falling on one side or the other. So the first is um, President Johnson in the 1960s. So he was the architect of the Great Society Program, which was um, a, uh, you know, the biggest social, social welfare program uh, since FDR. So he says, the, bro the program I shall propose will help that one fifth of all American families with incomes too small to even meet their basic needs. Our chief weapons would be better schools and better health, and better homes, and better training, and better job opportunities to help more Americans escape from squalor and misery and unemployment, right? So you get a sense of things pressing on individuals, there's not much they can do about it, and government can step in to help. And then the next quote comes from Ronald Reagan, who famously just tried to completely dismantle the Great Society and had some success. Probably lots of quotes that you could find, one here, and it's actually from in the 1960s, um, he was working on uh, honing his conservatism for a while. Uh, unemployment insurance is an occasion for freeloaders. And um, I'm going to confuse things a little bit more. And here I'm going to turn to present day and um, this other kind of attribution, which is genetic attribution, biological innate. And it turns out that our current president of the US is, as he has described it, a gene believer. Uh, he believes in um, a racehorse theory of success. These are all his words that success is bred. Uh, so here he says, I believe in being prepared, but in many respects, the most important thing is innate ability. So here we have yet another way of explaining inequality, something we haven't actually seen too much recently in American politics, but you can find um, quotes from, from Donald Trump uh, indicating that 
this is one of the ways he appears to, to uh, explain success. So in this project, um, I want to examine um, how much of this conventional wisdom holds true about how people explain inequality. So the first of all is I want to know, you know, as I said, people haven't really dug into this. Scientists haven't really dug into this. How much is this true that you can consistently find the right blaming individuals and people on the left trying to excuse them or blaming society? Does that really hold um, across different types of causal explanations? Does it hold across different types of inequality, right? It's different types of people are followed behind economically. And then the second thing is, you know, there's often this assumption, um, not necessarily among political psychologists, I would say, but um, at least in classic work in causal attributions, there's this assumption that people start with their causal attributions. Uh, so you raise a family, say, there's a lot of socialization, um, and you, you believe people pulling themselves up by the bootstraps, uh, and then you become a conservative, right? You're reacting to that. Or, um, uh, or the opposite, you know, for the bleeding heart liberal, um, you know, maybe socialization of the family, you're learning in school about, you know, how much discrimination there's been in society against certain groups, and so therefore, you know, liberal. So that causal direction has something, is something I would say um, is still a conventional wisdom in some parts, um, but as we know in political psychology, there's a lot of motivated reasoning out there, um, and um, it may be that the causal direction goes in a different direction. Okay, so um, in, in terms of uh, the literature that I'm drawing on, this is shameless self-promotion. Um, so I'm drawing on a wide literature, um, but I, I guess I, I want to indicate that even though I'm at the beginning of this book project, um, I am taking a lot of knowledge that I've learned from these collaborative projects that I've worked on about genetic attributions. Um, and I'm taking, then I'm, I'm kind of blowing it up and taking a much broader look at attributions. And so, um, you know, this is kind of where I get to the place of thinking that the net conventional wisdom ought to be challenged. So, um, at the start here, um, an article that I did in, in POQ, um, I did find, um, with Toby Jarrett, we did find conservative liberal difference. Uh, conservatives were somewhat, it's a small effect, conservatives were somewhat more likely to say that perceived class and race differences were genetic. Um, the difference is probably smaller than most people would have thought. And if you asked about um, traits in general, even IQ, you know, uh, this very politicized notion among academics is that IQ is a genetic, you actually find no conservative liberal difference. Right? So I'm starting to see here that maybe the conventional wisdom about how the population breaks down is not true. Uh, the second article, um, builds on that first, and we find that even with this very, very politicized notion of class and race differences, and whether they may be innate, that you actually, among the public, you don't find a conservative liberal difference unless that information is accompanied by a politicized frame, right? So you kind of have to hit people over the head over it, have ordinary folks. Um, so again, uh, some of this conventional wisdom about right-left differences is not holding up. Um, this, this is, a uh, third paper is new, and um, this looks more at the consistency of people blaming individuals for falling behind or excusing them, and then being likely to connect up that blame or excuse with economic conservatism or liberalism. So that tight constraint that Congress went looking for and mostly didn't find. And what we find is that that tight constraint here only emerges consistently, this is a pretty high bar, only consistently emerges among very, very affluent Americans. Right? So we found we uncovered what we call an ideology of, of affluence. Um, not that it isn't elsewhere, but it's just less consistent. And then finally, this gets to, um, this gets to the issue of causation. Um, yeah, I was trying to get rid of that message, sorry. Um, this gets to, the last one gets to the issue of causation, which is, you know, whether there's an, a logical association, people starting with these factual premises and then changing their attitudes. And so this is a kind of different article about people's um, tolerance towards lesbians and gays, uh, belief in, in gay marriage and that sort of thing. 
And um, what we find here is that even though certain beliefs are tightly correlated, so in this case, the belief that people are born gay and tolerance toward lesbians and gays, um, very, very tight correlation in the United States. You should not assume that the attribution of the belief, the actual belief comes first. What we did in this study is we moved around that factual belief and the attitudes did not budge at all. And if anything, we saw some motivated reasoning where liberals were more likely to believe congenial factual beliefs, conservatives to believe congenial factual beliefs. So that kind of politicization of the facts, people's attitudes didn't move, right? So anyway, this is just to say that, you know, in this particular area I've been working in, um, I've been kind of accumulating, uh, you know, instances of the conventional wisdom about attributions in various respects not really holding up. So, um, so back to this big project that, that I'm working on, um, there are three goals that I'm going to accomplish and um, we're going to touch on uh, each today. So the first is that I, I simply want to do a, some descriptive work. So some thorough mapping of the relationship between how Americans explain basic inequality, class inequality, um, and also race and gender inequality, all linked to economic differences. I'm not getting into political rights, so that sort of thing, or suppression, all linked to economic differences. And I want to think through, and this is just, and this is where I'm very much at the beginning part, I want to think through the reasons why there may be a linkage between those causal attributions and, and people's political views. Um, thinking about causal direction, as well as even if we can find out which way the arrow goes, why it goes in the direction it goes. And then um, finally, I haven't uh, talked too much about this last point, but I also want to think about um, the extent to which people's, um, whether they themselves, their social identities are more dominant or more marginalized, and whether that seems to affect how they explain inequality. You can probably imagine some ways in which uh, they may link up um, and one thing that's going to come out of this project, and I'm maybe putting the cart for the horse a little bit, but that politics seems to play a bigger role than one's group status. Um, so the, um, I'm, I'm about to get into a bunch of data, and what I'm going to do in boring social scientific style is I'm going to essentially tell you what I'm going to at the get-go, and then we'll go through, <laughs> go through the data. But um, so I have three basic points that are descriptive points and then three different points that are causal points um, that, that we'll be walking through today. So in terms of thinking through the conventional wisdom, um, the first thing that I want to note is that when it comes to blaming individuals uh, or blaming society, there's the stereotype of Americans being blamers. It's actually, at least in my data, not the case. Um, there is some truth to the left-right divide, right? With Conservatives being more likely to blame and liberals to excuse. But what I'm going to show you is that, in fact, it is true, my suspicion is right, that this is not at all as consistent as you might expect. It differs a lot depending on the type of question asked um, uh, with some interesting, uh, interesting patterns that I think are meaningful and talk some that, that basically reflect on causation. So three points on causation is that um, I do, I'm not completely overturning the apple cart here. I think it is likely that there are some stable causal explanations that exert some influence on people's political opinions. Um, however, this is where I start to be kind of controversial in various respects. Um, I actually am um, seeing some evidence that people may be gravitating toward beliefs that justify a person's status hierarchy. Um, maybe also most of their egos. Um, and that political parties, American political parties, this, I don't know how to go to the US this is, but um, that they may be playing a role in organizing this process. Okay, so um, the data sets that I'll be looking at, two different data sets, 2016 data, 2018 data. Um, I, I won't talk too much about this. Um, probably most of you are familiar with the uh, Cooperative Congressional Election Study. So I had a double module on there, just means I had more people. Um, and then the second study I did, I did on my own uh, with YouGov, and they also do the CCS. Um, so both of them are representative samples. In the first case, um, close to 2,000 people. In the second case, about 1,000. Um, and in that second study, 
Um, one innovation is that I'm going to be playing around with what types of inequality I'm asking about. Right? So instead of just doing kind of the classic questions where you say, you know, what about black Americans and Latinx, right? We know they make less money than others. What do you think about that? What about women? As we all know about the gender wage gap, I'm going to ask about white people. So in the US, whites are less than Asian Americans on average. And I'm also going to ask what rural people, rural Americans, um, earn less than those who live in urban areas. Okay, so first, uh, and actually, let me pause and any questions before I get going. Feel free to ask clarifying questions. Okay, so we're looking at the 2016 data. And um, what we're going to do is going to look at descriptives first. We're going to look at um, descriptives by party. And then we are going to look at some coefficient plots. So I hope you like coefficient plots. Um, <laughs> looking at uh, linkages between causal attributions and policy attitudes. In terms of the descriptives, um, I'm going to show you some um, violin plots. So I hope you also like violin plots. Um, we'll, we'll get to that when we get to that. The questions that I asked um, in terms of how people explain inequality were basically borrowed from the American National Election Study. Um, with some tweaks to wording, and then I uh, approved a furlough for 2018. I have another group of questions that I won't talk about today. But I think too much. Uh, so we start with the question STEM. Why do you think it is that in America today, some people have worse jobs and lower incomes than others? And there are five different explanations. Each five, each of these five is going to be a variable. Right? So it's not like people just select one. Uh, so in response to one, because some people have less inborn ability to learn, and people could strongly disagree to strongly agree. <coughs> one to six. Because some people choose not to work as hard, again, strongly disagree to strongly agree. Because there's a culture of low expectations in some communities, because discrimination holds some people back, because some people don't have access to high quality schools and jobs. Okay. So that's the basic question. And then there was a second version where I asked about um, blacks and Latinos versus whites. And then another version where I asked about women versus men. Um, eventually, I'll be unpacking these today. I'm talking about a summary measure. So essentially, your reaction to these five um, averaged across some people, blacks and Latinos, and women falling behind others, right? So kind of traditional marginalized groups falling behind others. Okay. So here's our first filing plot. Um, so filing plots show you, they're nice because they show you the median, <coughs> the median in a quartile range, and they give you a shape of the distribution. This is all this is doing, rather than simply look at a mean, right? That's not very informative. So um, what we see here, first of all, is at least these questions. Americans are not doing as much blaming, I think, as the conventional wisdom would say. So first of all, least popular is an eight IQ. Choosing work, not to work hard, second least popular. Right in the middle is a culture of low expectations. And then the most popular ones, although by just a snitch, is access to jobs and education. I would call that structural inequality and then discrimination, right? So you can just kind of follow the mean, the medians up, which is one way to track things. Okay, so um, maybe not what people would expect at the get-go, but of course, we know there's a lot of variation, in particular, across people of different um, political ideologies, political parties. So what happens when we look at this by party? First of all, we get some things that look like canoes, colorful canoes, which is fun. Um, so if you go to Democrats over here, we find that there's you know, something that's almost looking like a slope here. I did arrange these in a certain way on purpose. So uh, an AIQ is least popular, choosing not to work, and then culture, and then at the top, jobs and education and discrimination. Okay, so maybe, you know, what we would expect. Um, so actually this is, is looking somewhat like conventional wisdom. Um, and, um, and I should say, first of all, just to clarify, so one, two, three, these are gonna be in the a version of disagree, and then four, five, six are a version of agree, just to clarify that. Here's independence, it starts to flatten out, and then you come over here to Republicans, you see this interesting U shape. First of all, innate IQ is unpopular across the board. But we see with Republicans, as we might expect, choosing not to work in culture of the most popular, 
not so much a fan of jobs in education, or well, a bit at the midpoint, and then discrimination, not big believers in discrimination causing trouble. Okay? So we are for the most part seeing what we might expect in terms of how the parties break down. And next we're going to look at this a little bit more systematically. And so um, I have uh, a Clinton-Trump uh, feeling thermometer comparison. If you're at the high end, you like Clinton, Hillary Clinton a lot more. Um, got a question on how much people value economic equality, kind of in the abstract. And the um, question, and these are, are, are measurement scales, um, <coughs> uh, specific battery on how, how much government should help the people who are falling behind, right? So essentially a big government battery, all things Bernie Sanders um, wants for, for the American people. Um, so this is where I'm starting. I have other measures in my data set, um, uh, but I'm not, I'm not gonna show those to you here. Okay, so I am going to start on the right-hand side where we have something really big popping out here. So we start over here in discrimination. And this is a um, multivariate regression. And for the time being, these are my only five independent variables. I can tell you if I add democrat demographic controls, nothing really changes. So discrimination closely associated with thinking that our society should be more equal economically. Also believing that there should be lots more government aid, right? So <coughs> intuitively, I think what we would expect, access to jobs and education, also a positive coefficient there and there, although it really pales in comparison to that discrimination item. Culture of low expectations, choosing not to work as hard. If you believe that, you're blaming people. <coughs> you don't think it's as important to try to equalize society. And you're less in favor of robust government aid. And finally, and this is maybe an interesting piece, if you believe that people are born smart or not so smart, and that impacts their success, you actually lean in the liberal direction on these items. That may sound strange to you. <coughs> this is actually not the first time this is coming up. There's a JOP piece by some of the biopolitics researchers that finds something along similar lines. Um, and we can, we can talk about that, why that may be. But what I mostly want to say about this is that in terms of like the ideological logic of causal attributions, this is what we expect. Blaming versus excusing falling on the right or the left, right? <coughs> With this one exception, and this one exception may be the way in which we think about genetics is changing right, um, in our genetic age. There may be some reason to feel sympathy for people, for example, who are hampered by their genetics. This is not my belief, I'm just saying perceptions, right? This is the feeling thermometer, Clinton versus Trump. We get something very similar with the exception that this isn't all over here. Um, but essentially we're looking at basically patterns here to see how well this holds up across different variables. So what I just showed you was um, in some ways a challenge to conventional wisdom overall, people blaming less than you might think. But in other ways, with that one exception holds up conventional wisdom in terms of left-right differences. However, Things change when we start playing around with the groups that are the focus of our attention. Right? So one thing about all of this causal attribution research that's been done in the US context is that it tends to ask about salient um, marginalized groups. People of color, underrepresented minorities, and women, sometimes asking kind of a general class question. <coughs> all of those individuals these days are associated with the Democratic Party, and they're associated with the left. So, it may be when people are answering these questions about why black people are falling behind, and then matching that up with their political views, you know, maybe there's this tight Conversian constraint, and it's all very logical. Or maybe people just want to defend members of their coalition, right? And think bad things about members of the other coalition. We kind of flip it around and think about 
all these Republicans and people on the right who are blaming Blacks and Latinos and women for falling behind, well, maybe that's, maybe it's a strategy, right? In order to make an argument for having a smaller welfare state. And actually, this is the reason why I want you to read a lot of literatures, there are people who basically argue this, like Marty Gillens, you go back to work on prejudice, often a separate literature from the political and cost of futures literature, you find people making this argument. But actually, a lot of this is, it may look logical, but it's not really. It is something that um, these causal explanations are strategically employed. So one way in which to start thinking about whether this is going on is you have to start asking about other kinds of groups. You have to ask, start asking about other kinds of inequality. So in this new study, I added in some new questions. So in some ways, we're going to be doing something very similar to what we saw before, but I have, I'm asking people to explain not only inequality between people of color and whites and between women and men, but I also ask about, as I mentioned before, white Americans relative to Asian Americans and rural Americans versus those who live in urban areas. So now this is what the questions look like at least <coughs> with those new groups. And the brackets are where I'm substituting in different groups. You can see, oh, okay, all of a sudden this reads a little bit differently. Why do you think it is that Americans today, white Americans tend to have lower incomes and less wealth than Asian Americans? This many white people are born less intelligent. This many white people choose not to work as hard. Because there's a culture of low expectations in many white communities, because many white people don't have access to high quality schools and jobs. This discrimination holds many white people back. So, now I'm going to have two summary measures. I'm going to have one summary measure for why you think members of the Democratic coalition are falling behind. And then I'm going to have other, another summary measure about why you think members of the Republican coalition are falling behind. Okay? Everybody answered all questions in random order, right? But I'll separate those two summary measures, again, ranging from one to six. Um, and then I forgot to mention the coefficient plots are Everything is on a zero to one scale, so we can easily compare those a hand. Do you ask it the other way? Do you ask why are Asian Americans? I didn't. didn't. Uh, why are Asian Americans doing better than white Americans? So the ANES has that randomization, at least in in some of its um, uh, in some of its questions. And I thought about that, and it was it's just a little bit too many variations to run. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But it does, it does change things, and there are some scholars working on, on that, so it is a limitation. Okay, so um, I'm quickly going to run through, first, the questions about the left coalition. These are going to look very similar to before, so I won't belabor it. But um, this is, I'm sorry, the box is coming things up, but this is the average for race and gender. It looks similar to what we saw before, actually remarkably similar. Two, two years later, right, um, different group of people. And then our violin plots. Um, same sort of thing, some differences, but Democrats, you see that slope. Republicans, you see that U-shape. Independents, somewhere in between. Okay? Um, what starts to look different is when we start asking about why white people fall behind Asian Americans and why rural people are falling behind. This is those questions. So the distribution now has people are maybe are they're not used to seeing these questions, right? So you overall see less enthusiasm for these different explanations. So it's like the box covers it. So is this is um, the average for rural rural and whites. Rural and whites. Yeah. Together. So to get average together, yeah. So why whites are falling behind Asians and why rural Americans are falling behind urban Americans. Right. I do realize this is some averaging. Um, but they are fairly tightly correlated. So you can see that yeah, the, the distribution has changed here, and you also um, don't see a clear uh, winner. Right before we saw these two were quite popular. That's no longer the case. You see more similarity across them. So what I think gets more interesting is when you start to look by party, and the patterns that we saw before totally fall away. And so now, I mean, we, one similarity is that this innate explanation remains not very popular. Okay, again, this is this is from 
rural whites, members of the Republican coalition. But for Democrats, who typically are known as being, you know, bleeding heart Democrats, they love to excuse people. Now, these two blaming items here, choosing not to work in culture, they are actually somewhat more popular among Democrats than discrimination. Jobs and education, hanging out at the midpoint, and we go over to Republicans, and now they are placing discrimination against white people, against rural people, at the same level as they would place hard work and culture. Okay, so we start to see this difference. And if we look at our effects plots, um, which I'll do shortly, we can um, see that in, I think, finer grained terms, okay? So, um, so just a couple more things that, that I'll show you um, before I, I wrap it up, just a lot of data to look at. So um, similar to what I did before, we have outcome variables, and our outcome variables are one's political party, that feeling thermometer item, what do you value economic inequality, economic inequality against support for robust government assistance? So very similar to what we saw before. Um, everything's on a zero to one scale. This is a simple OLS regression, multiple regression. <clears throat> um, I'm going to whip through the findings for our democratic groups. So that's here. And if you remember, this is a very similar pattern to what we saw before with discrimination most closely associated with our dependent variables. Here we do get some no results, <coughs> choosing not to work related to clearly to conservatism, for the most part culture as well, but a similar relationship. Now if we change our explanatory variables to how you explain inequality among whites versus Asians and rural people versus um, those living in urban areas, you see the pattern completely changes. Okay, and so let me just walk through what um, I see as the most important changes here and the most important similarities. Discrimination <coughs> before was the thing that was just over the top associated with liberal views, right? You saw that at the top of the chart. Now we have null effects, right? Mm -hmm. So discrimination, you see a lot of discrimination against white people, against rural people, doesn't really divide left and right here. Another big change you see is that blaming people's culture, those people just culture, they said culture of low expectations. Um, when you say that about rural people and about white people, suddenly now that is associated with liberalism. So these people on the left are issuing that blame, which doesn't accord, right, with a traditional leftist ideology. We see some things that make more sense, choosing not to work, jobs and education fall as you would expect, and this looks the same. The big difference is again with discrimination and with culture flipping around. Um, so I, if you can bear with me, I have one more effect spot to show you. <laughs> And what I want to do is I want to do one last thing, and I want to show you what happens when we, and this is maybe the most important thing, when we think about people's bias in a pure form, which is we're going to ask how much you blame these groups in the Democratic coalition, we're going to ask how much you blame these groups in the Republican coalition, we're just going to do a subtraction, we're just going to do a relative comparison. So we can do the same thing in terms of excusing people in the Democratic coalition, and excusing people in the Republican coalition, doing subtraction. So it's all about relative blame or relative excuse, which is maybe a pure form of 
left right bias. And when we take these relative measures, how much you're basically seem to be preferring one group to the other, blaming or excusing, and this is where the coefficients they get really, really large. So to be clear, on the right-hand side here, that's discrimination. So this is comparing people at the top of the scale. They say there's a ton of discrimination against blacks, Latinos, women, and there's no discrimination against whites, rural people. Right? At the bottom of that measure is people saying there's a ton of discrimination against whites, rural people, no discrimination against um, blacks, Latinos, and women. So that measure, right, of who do you think is discriminated against, that has a coefficient of about 0.8. This is an enormous coefficient. I realize I know about, don't know about the controls in the model, but this is almost single-handedly, apparently, explaining, at least in this case, voting and partisanship. Same sorts of things for relative blame, right? If you're blaming people in the Democratic coalition much more than people in the Republican coalition, you are much more likely, in this case, to have partisanship, Republican partisanship, prefer Trump, and this is the items that are the policy items, right? So, you know, when we distill it down to that bias, I think you can really see um, how important this may be, um, at least in terms of how tightly it's associated with people's political views. Okay. So that's all the data I'm showing you. I can go back to things if you'd like in the Q&A. Um, but to wrap things up, just as a summary of what we've seen, so we're taking stock of conventional wisdom. So overall, Americans are not so enamored of individual blaming explanations for inequality. Um, and if people who are maybe concerned about genetic determinism, that's the least popular um, explanation of the ones that I looked at. Uh, structural inequality, it's actually pretty popular. Right, which is, um, it's possible that it has increased in recent years because we have so much inequality in the United States. Uh, but the left and right are inconsistent in their attributions. There is maybe some stability. Conservatives, uh, people on the right, do seem to emphasize working hard. Right? We've known that for a while. That's probably the most consistent thing to see in this data. But you find that these other explanations, they flip around when it seems to be convenient for people. Right? When they, um, uh, through a motivated process or some other process, uh, want to defend themselves, members of their, of their party coalition. Um, and the, finally, the thing to look at is that when you are looking at those bias measures, um, the, the causal stories that seem to be most important in terms of um, Linking that bias to people's political views had to do with hard work and culture and discrimination. And I haven't yet had to admit thought through why some of these causal stories are communicating that bias better than others. And I'd be interested to hear thoughts on that. Um, and so the last um, <coughs> last slide here is um, just thinking through um, some limitations of this and questions I have is that um, you know, some explanations for socioeconomic inequality, they do seem to be um, uniformly unpopular, popular, those innate explanations versus structural inequality. And um, maybe, this is, maybe this is a good thing. Maybe this communicates there are places of consensus. Maybe it communicates that this is uh, people getting it right, um, probably philosophers of science would they kind of think of saying that, but um, and if, if we're thinking strategically for people who care about economic inequality, that might be a place to focus, especially structural inequality. In order to kind of find common ground between left and right and, and um, uh, being persuasive about, about why it is that we need government help. Um, but you know, this generates a lot of questions that I do need to, to work on. Motivated reasoning does seem to be a big piece of this. I, I have to admit, I haven't totally sorted out how this works. Um, how is this process playing out? Are people spontaneously reacting to these questions and saying like, oh, I want to defend, you know, my people? Uh, or is this 
something that is actually playing out on the ground within the political parties in the following parts and cues. For example, Paul Ryan says, okay, we want to excuse this group, not this group. So how is this actually working? And how would I get at that? This is not an easy question. Um, I wonder about whether this, this motivated reason could be overcome. Um, and um, the last thing here, um, this is maybe the question that, that keeps me up at night, which is that if causal attributions are more affecting cause, why are they so important? Right? We see Ronald Reagan talking about them, and we see Donald Trump talking about them. You know, we see them in people's members of Congress trying to justify their legislation. But if we're not actually doing causal work themselves, why are we so preoccupied with them? Um, and uh, that's, I guess, maybe my, my biggest question. I need to talk to some philosophers or something. But thank you, uh, thanks very much. And if you want to field your own questions, I'll show you today. Oh, I can do it. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> okay. There's two points I'd like to make. First, I think Asian American versus whites is not very effective because I, don't, I think that very few people are aware of it. And so you're asking to explain something that doesn't mean anything to them. Okay. And, and so I'd be very suspicious of anything. I think if you turned it around and say, why are Asian Americans doing better? I think you'd get, get somewhat different explanations. My more serious question is the following, which is that you make a, a kind of equivalence of the two kinds of equality. Mm -hmm. and, and I think when it comes to discrimination, it's not possible to discriminate against rural people. What you're talking about, in other words, they've chosen to live there. And that's why, if they are unequal, it's because they, they, they've done that. It's not possible to say, ah, they are poorer than us than, than others because we're discriminating against rural people. So I think by placing an equivalence and expecting the left to, the left to treat that discrimination equally that they treat uh, racial minority is placing a burden on them which is very, I, would, I was going to say unfair, but let me say unrealistic. Not unfair of my research process. Well, your expectation. Yeah. But somehow, if they're going to be consistent yeah. about equality, they should be answering about discrimination the same way on, uh, that they do to the other groups. And that's simply unfair. Okay, I'll use that word. Yeah, okay. So, um, so let me, let me, uh, so just go back to the question about Asian Americans. Um, so, it is true that, I mean, because the groups that we're always asking about that are so salient in news, et cetera, um, our members of the Democratic Coalition had to go digging a little bit, right? And I thought a lot about, you know, what groups was I going to put up there, what groups were going to put up there. And um, um, so even if it's something that, a fact that people are more comfortable with, it's going to be, you know, it's kind of surprising. It's, um, so there's, there's, a, it's, it's, there's a lack of equivalence there, and I totally understand but, that, and I need to think about that more. But, but, but I do think it can that, get to cause a Before I get yeah. to the second one, yeah. if they've heard about that at all, yeah. they've heard about, that they may be quotas on them from getting into good schools. If, if there's any discrimination vis-a-vis -vis Asian Americans, it's in the other direction. So I really think you're making a well, really no, no, there's quotas yeah. because there's too many, there's more Asians than there are white people in the schools. Exactly. Well. So, it's not, so, it's, <laughs> it's so it's a so it's yeah. a it's, it's discrimination <laughs> against not discrimination against white white people vis-a-vis -vis Asian Americans, but discrimination. So, so my so so my view of that is that um, I actually I don't think that ordinary folks in my sample would have thought through unless they were Asian uh, would have thought through discrimination against Asian Americans. But I, I think there's something more about that that there are a lot of Asian Americans doing well in higher education. Right. That may be resentment. It's a different sort of thing. But this is exactly these things play out differently on the ground. I recognize, but I, I still feel as though it's valuable to. Even if, we, and I have to think about how to talk about this in a, a more careful way, but it's still valuable to get at uh, some of the um, psychological processes here that maybe try not, maybe not a perfect contrast, but just to show that the patterns aren't there when you talk about other groups. 
And they weren't, they weren't random patterns. It wasn't a bunch of null results, right? There seemed to be some meaning there when we switched, um, when we switched things up on my respondents. But, but, I, but I take your point. And but as to rural Americans, I actually would disagree. I, um, I actually think that there's, a, I don't think it sounds um, like, I don't know, uh, Hawaiian up here or something. But um, I actually do think that there is prejudice against rural Americans in the United States. And it's, it's not only that people choose to live in a certain location, mm -hmm. but, but there's a kind of rural culture. And um, um, some of the things that show up in my, my data, I kind of glossed over, is that like Clinton voters, for example, they seem happier uh, than you might expect to say that rural people are innately not so smart. I mean, that was part of what came out here. And I, I agree, I agree yeah. with the other, just that discrimination, yeah. that particular variable. Yeah. It's a bit hard to say how, do yeah. they, how, how are they discriminated against. Yeah, and I, I so, um, you know, I'll, I mean, we should probably move on, but, but one thing, there are some things, I would be maybe more skeptical of my own data if I hadn't actually seen that there's data being gathered by places like Pew that are showing that this discrimination item moves around, it, it, it is rather detached from reality. So you actually, other people have found on the white item that Republicans are pretty attached to this notion that white people are discriminated against the India in the United States. Um, so there are some pat patterns emerging elsewhere that are similar. Yeah. Right. Um, I'm Carol Love Island studying some of the see you get um, you, I came in just a little bit after the start of your talk, so you may have not mentioned this, but what I'm struck by is the absence of media or the communication infrastructure that would mediate those political beliefs. And the, I, I don't know whether it would be an intervening variable or a part of your causality argument, but yeah. it may in fact explain or be something that could contribute to why the causality, the causal attributions are not as causal as you're yeah. seeing them. That it may be the, so what is the source what is the transmission of that political belief? And that in and of itself may influence how someone receives that information. So if it's coming from Fox Television versus a Glenn Beck versus uh, The Guardian may give you a very different interpretation of the same. Um, yeah, so there aren't clear cues except for me and the survey era has sold on this. Um, and um, actually, interestingly, at points, you see, I did give people the, res the opportunity to argue back. And um, in the second study, actually, going to the rural piece was interesting. What I saw most there was, this is a little off, I'll, I'll go back to it, but you see people saying like, yeah, we don't make as much money out here in these rural areas, um, because this is the lifestyle we choose. So it was a different sort of ego defense going on. but. Um, but I can look more into those responses to CIC. But what I actually thought maybe you were going to say is that people hear different narratives from the media. Well, so, that too. Yeah. So it's again, it's that mediating yeah. influence. That yeah. You, you may be, the political party you may be transmitting a particular message that then gets translated differently depending on who is transmitting it and how you're experiencing it. Way in yeah. which you hear it depends on how you see it. Because yeah. you already have a certain assumption about, yeah. oh, yeah. oh, if so and so says it, if Obama says this, then it must mean that. Yeah, yeah. yeah so I need to think more about this. I, I, I don't think I'm going to have time to put an explicit media piece in this study and have to think about um, so next step. Yeah, yeah. But it's, it's not happening in a vacuum. Right. You know, I mean, people are coming with knowledge and expectations. I would just add one other piece to the rural. I, I would seriously question the choice factor. I mean, we do have many rural populations in the U.S. that are there not by choice. They were there because, in fact, they were either pushed out of urban centers. Uh -huh. 
uh, if you look at uh, certain movements along the East Coast, you will see a disproportionate number of uh, the term here, visible minorities, uh, underrepresented populations that have been pushed back out into rural settings yeah. Yeah. because for economic reasons. Yeah. So I would I think that can be a play factor as well in how the discrimination is existing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's actually interesting. Yeah, thank you. So when when thank you for this interesting talk um, <coughs> and this kind of vision of the book project. Uh, when you showed us the the first the <coughs> slides of, of your survey about asking the question more generally about some people. Yes. Um, and then I thought in the experiment, what you would do is you would just exchange the some for some white versus some uh, Afro-Americans versus some rural people and not actually build in this comparison. Yeah. And instead then show exactly how these groups compare with each other in their answers and you, you then you can also statistically measure the difference and whether it's significant yeah. or different not just showing the uh, you know how they how the pattern is um, and but but this comparison i think adds a completely different dimension uh to your original question because i think that the interesting part is whether people change their answers just if another if if this is attributed to to one of the groups yeah. and, and uh, i think and with this double comparison you there's so much uh, going on, and um, yeah. you would really need to know more first about how people think about the inequality in these groups more generally, and then uh, to understand uh, their answers. So I, I wonder why you structured it as an implicit uh, comparison between two groups instead of just looking at one group. Uh, um, so, so basically just manipulating yeah. the one group that is mentioned. So I have I have individual measures, and I, I mean this is something I will eventually do. There's obviously a lot of data to look at, and I chose to look at it in a particular way today. But um, and and these are the most striking. These I think are the most salient patterns to present. Um, but in the first study, for example, I can isolate the questions, the some people questions, which is a general mm -hmm. right um, kind of general look at economic inequality. I can isolate that from it, the ones that asked about Black Americans, the ones that asked about um, gender. Right? Mm -hmm. Everybody got all questions, but I can certainly look to see how the patterns are different. And I've done some of that mm -hmm. already. Um, and um, one interesting thing is if we're thinking about demographic groups, um, I know this is very specific, and this is more general uh, approach kind of. Um, Thing you were urging, but but women are some of the most defensive of um, kind of people blaming women. I thought that was interesting, um, more so than other demographic groups when you're comparing, you know, women men versus not. But um, uh, but this is something that that I will do. And um, and do you have thoughts about how I would structure that analysis? Are you imagining that these would all be explanatory variables? The some people. Black Americans. Well, I don't know how the vignettes are asked. I, I yeah. guess I, I, I didn't know you asked about all the groups. In, I did, yeah. First yeah. Okay. yeah. That, that I wasn't aware of. Yeah, but I can analyze, I will analyze them differently. Um, more so more so than you would think they are they are correlated until you start jumping those, as I call them, coalitional lines. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some of that may be an artifact of I'm asking the people a bunch of questions and they anchor. But yeah, I need to unpack them for sure. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you for your talk. And I actually, I, I thought it was really clever to use the comparison between Asian and white Americans. But actually what I had uh, in the urban rural, but what I had some question about was uh, the way you describe the differences um, in attributions as being inconsistent. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you're looking at liberals, like let's say liberal or people on the left um, have a certain belief about the nature of you know, the American social hierarchy, uh, where it's a, kind of a hierarchy of significant yes. distinction that uses people of color and inner city people to demarcate where the bottom is. Now, according to that sort of like logic of significant distinction, then it makes sense to say that people of color or people in urban centers 
when they aren't making it, it's because of discrimination. But when you point out that, oh, there's also white people on the bottom, it makes no sense to say that that is because of discrimination, mm -hmm. right? So they have to attribute that to something else. Mm -hmm. So it sort of would entail this kind of like flattening out that you would see. So to me, that seems really consistent. Yeah. And same with people on the right, where it's if they have this belief that actually the nature of American society is like doing too much to evaluate people of color and, you know, urban folk. Yeah. Then it also kind of. I, I think I agree. I need to work on this. I mean, this is, um, um, you know, this has very much been on my mind. And, um, you know, maybe I'm putting too much weight on kind of the conventional wisdom of the causal attribution literature. Which, which almost, I guess one way to describe it is that um, uh, scholars have thought of ordinary citizens as being very principled about their views about inequality. Principled in the sense of it's this thing or that thing, right? It's either people need to work harder or the structural inequality. And that's been this very simple lens. And so what I'm saying is, is it matters who you ask about. Yeah. But, you know, again, this is, uh, I think it's not necessarily an illogic, I think is what you're saying. Like it's, it's, it, it is literally inconsistent in the sense that, that I'm just describing the patterns I see, but it doesn't mean it's not logical. There are different views of the world and the extent to which uh, marginalized groups have suffered from you know, forces beyond their control versus people who reject that view of marginalized groups and then see dominant groups as maybe suffering um, uh, because of a, a misplaced focus on some groups and not others, right? Yeah. Yeah, like that would be the Trump voters and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I like stuff more. I think I would give up more. Yeah. Um, yeah, also, I also agree that um, I'm on the side of keeping the Asian American white comparison, and uh, especially um, some like. Dean Lacey has been working on how um, some people who answered um, non uh, did not identify as white during, uh, during the, the 2010 census voted for Trump and identified as white in their in explaining their vote for Trump. So so all the plasticity. Can sorry, can you say that on They had in the 2010 census. Yeah not identified as white but when they were asked about their trump vote okay they said they were they identified as white okay so perhaps um you know biracial or latino you know, a third of latinos voted for for trump do they the plasticity of their own uh right. racial identification so when you compare when you say um Asian Americans versus white, white then becomes a broader category than when you're comparing mm -hmm. white versus black or white mm -hmm. versus Latino. Mm -hmm. And that so might help Latino Yeah, example. that might help also kind of contextualize the okay. changes, right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And I what was the article you mentioned? Dean Lacey. It's uh it's, I think it's a draft right now. So there is something that's been published recently about um, people's racial identities in the United States. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 yeah, okay, thank you. Ah. Other questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, when you were at the figure 12, when you were talking about uh, the magnitude of the effect, um, I was just wondering, uh, the DV goes from minus one to one, right? Because when when you do a subtraction, it's not now now it's not all on zero to one. That's you are right. like being very close attention to this. So <laughs> it naturally goes from negative one to one yeah. but because I wanted to be very consistent with, with effect sizes. I then recoded it so that it would go from zero to one, so everything is zero to one. So you get the coefficient of point eight or something like that. It's a huge coefficient. No controls. <laughs> almost, almost suspicious. <laughs> almost suspicious. Almost I, yeah, that's not the way to say that. So, um, uh, it would make sense on a minus one to plus one scale. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. maybe it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. I can, I can go back and check, and and I'll start to to add in controls. I, as I said, demo, demographic controls do very little. However, there are other attitudinal controls that I might add. 
And um, so people have, you know, and it's, I mean, I'd be interested to know what additional controls people think I would ought to add. So I've had some grant reviewers talk about social dominance orientation, so I have social dominance orientation. So that will start to eat away at the coefficients. I can put in different races and prejudice structures. Uh, but the problem is once you start to do that, conceptually it overlaps with, to some extent with what I'm doing. And so I don't, I don't need to have coefficients that large to get suspicious. Um, but um, uh, there's a theoretical question as to what, what the right attitudinal controls are to add. And I have to admit, uh, beyond maybe social dominance orientation, I'm not your thoughts on yeah. It would be a little downside. I, I, I just I don't I think it's did a not think about it because I, I, expect, I expect that, that the dv uh, that you were going to say that the dv goes from minus one to one. So yeah, I mean it's, I, it is it's it's OLS, okay. and so yeah. sometimes Thank you. you know you can overshoot the mark. Um, Thank you. Or throw it. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Any other questions? Maybe I can continue. Okay. <laughs> um, let's say I'm, I'm a liberal, a left liberal, and I believe that the state, that there are government policies that should deal with inequality. I feel that I'm, I'm worried about inequality. It's a problem, and I'd like to get the government. That's okay. I'm a standard liberal. And you ask me, well, what about inequality between rural people and urban people? So my answer is i don't i think that's unfortunate but there's nothing the state can do mm -hmm. and in other words you're asking me a question that and placing me into a category where i'm going to end up being sounding hypocritical because my usual ways of dealing with inequality not because i think it's unfair it's i don't care about rural people mm -hmm. while i care about urban minorities mm -hmm. but because the usual ways of dealing with Inequality doesn't apply in this case. I mean, I, I, I apparently am I'm much more sympathetic to the left people than you are. We may be equally liberal, I, but um, uh, yeah, you know, I see things differently. I think that there's been this, this interesting conversation in the U.S. Rural areas have, I think, in Canada have um, many of them have been decimated. You know, um, it's hard to make it with a small farm. Um, factories have closed, etc. And um, um, and I've actually seen some people in political science go to spear, which I'm sitting in that, um, you know, saying, hey, like, rural, rural people just move, just move. But I, I feel like actually that's a similar argument about inner cities, that you don't, there were jobs and they left. Like, people had families that grew up there and they left, the, 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 the jobs left. And um, I actually... I'm not saying I know what the correct answer is, but I, I, I do feel as though a, a consistent liberal who believes in government help uh, when people are unemployed because the jobs near where they grew up have left, uh, many liberals would say, well, no, the state actually should help to you know, incentivize um, job creation in those areas. Right now, yeah, now I'm gonna talk about politics. <laughs> Did you mind if I... Yeah. Maybe on that, maybe where you're at, kind of into a lot of responses. There are a lot more people who kind of refuse to answer that question because they feel like it, it, it's, it's not possible to hear them out. Um, I, I, I don't think I have a lot of knowledge on this. People were um, much more pained. They weren't forced to answer, but they were pained if they didn't answer. And they seem to be pretty obedient. <laughs> so I think it helps you to yeah. kind of keep people kind of in your brain.